Welcome to All Hail to the Pod. I'm Jim Slavin and this is the last episode of the current season of the pod. Thank you to all our subscribers at patreon.com slash all hail to the pod. But don't worry, over the summer, subscribers will get advanced access to new exciting projects from Cowgate Media and an exclusive t-shirt only for subscribers at patreon.com slash all hail to the pod. In this episode, I chat to scholar and activist Marianne Trashati in New York City about the life of Elizabeth Gurley Flynn. Mary Ann is just completing a book on Flynn. We discuss her life and work and what it means for working class politics today. Mary Ann, welcome to the pod. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. Thank you for having me. No, it's great. I'm really excited to speak to you about Elizabeth Gurley Flynn, somebody who has fascinated me for many years. And I think somebody whose name comes up a lot when they're looking into American labor history, but maybe doesn't get quite the coverage and attention that she deserves. So maybe we can make a small step to putting that right. Before we sort of take a deep dive into our political career, maybe you could tell us a little bit about our, our background in terms of our family's background and our growing up. Yeah, well, she was born in 1890. Uh, so she's uh, in some ways a product of the 19th century and conquered New Hampshire, but then her family moved to the Bronx. Um, so I always imagined her as a New Yorker, but her roots are in New England and in Ireland. So her dad uh, was Irish American. Her mom uh, was Irish, Annie Gurley, uh, a feminist. Uh, both parents were supporters of the Irish struggle for independence. And um, she is related to on her mother's side to George Bernard Shaw. Um, so there's, you know, she has a way with words. She was a, a really uh, talented writer, but her her, she really shown as an orator. Um, and you can see, I, you know, I always think, well, of course she's related to George Bernard Shaw. And then her, her um, nephew, Peter Martin, is one of uh, the founders of uh, City Lights Bookstore, which is an extraordinarily important and popular independent bookstore in San Francisco. So she's got, you know, this, this, uh, this kind of legacy and lineage of eloquence, both in print and in speech. So it's really kind of cool. And she also, I mean, her political career as an activist began really, really early. Obviously, she was we'll getting to how she was famously called the rebel girl. But I mean, she was an activist, um, including coming to the attention of police and what have you, at a very early age. Could maybe say a little bit about that? Because that's, it's unusual anywhere. But in, the, in that time, it was especially unusual, I think. Yeah. So, you know, it's like... Um... She kind of was, she was nourished intellectually on uh, radicalism. You know, her dad would bring her to socialist meetings and she absorbed all these things. She was a silver medal debater in high school. She was, by all accounts, everyone I've spoken to said she was just a really, she was, she loved life, but she was a really serious about her politics. And um, she started her activist career when she was a teenager. Uh, barely 16. In fact, I don't think she was yet 16. She gave a soapbox speech in um, in New York City and was arrested uh, for blocking traffic. Um, so she was a phenom, right? You, uh, it's interesting to read the press coverage of her early career because she was this really sharp, really eloquent, beautiful teenage girl. And at a time when most girls her age would have been thinking about clothes and dances and parties and boys she was up on a soapbox talking about the need for a socialist revolution and people ate it up with a spoon um you know coverage press coverage of her early speeches i think this was both a blessing and a curse because uh, and I, and i let me explain what i mean so press coverage of her early speeches she's raven haired and beautiful with a small waist and uh, you know this militant attitude, and and actually, someone wrote to her years later um, that they still remember her giving a speech. And this is even when she's she's a bit older, um, giving a speech in which she raised her hand, and she would do this thing where she would hold her hand like this and talk about. She learned this from Big Bill Haywood, another activist. That you know, this is these are working people without solidarity, right? But this is how we want to be together. And someone recalled to her in a letter, you know, in his 80s, that he still remembered her holding up her hand and it was the most beautiful hand he had ever seen so part of the package was her femininity and you know that she was this badass and this very beautiful teenage package now, of course we know that only lasts so long right when she's an older woman we he, i you know i read these accounts then of 
they're very, very, very different because she can no longer, she is no longer the rebel girl, right? That's a moniker that really is applicable to a young woman. Um, but it certainly, it certainly brought her an audience. Um, it brought her renowned, um, but it was well-deserved, right? I mean, she used, I think she used her femininity um, to great advantage as a young woman, um, but it was her brains and her eloquence that really uh, kept the audience. Um, if her looks brought them, her arguments uh, kept them. And I think it's quite interesting to contrast that, the, this young, attractive, eloquent woman who's um, getting involved in this type of political, radical, revolutionary political activism. But for a lot of people outside the United States, one thing that strikes me is they're not quite aware, uh, if you look at American labor history, just how violent this period was in terms of big strikes, but major physical confrontations between labor and capital, violent strikes, massacres. And in the midst of this, you have the rebel girl appearing. So Bibi, could you say a little bit about the sort of that, that context? Because for that 20 year period where we're talking about where she sort of intervenes, it, I mean, it is incredibly violent. Some, something that people for British labor history is quite alien to it. People I don't I didn't really appreciate quite how violent it was. Oh, absolutely. Uh, Lots of bloodshed in the history of U.S. labor, um, and it, this happened in a variety of ways. So strikes were brutally suppressed. Uh, you know, uh, mounted police would come in and trample workers. They would club them. They would hose them down. Many of the things, the images that people in the U.S. and around the world have of the brutality that was visited upon civil rights activists, um, you could think about that. Uh, you know, in the early 20th century, and a lot of those same tactics were visited upon striking workers, and not just striking workers, right? Um, even, you know, Elizabeth Gurley Flynn, as, as a, an organizer for the Industrial Workers of the World, uh, was also a leader of free speech fights that the IWW held. And so in Missoula, in Spokane, um, in Patterson, New Jersey, there was a, a, most people don't know, there was a free speech fight also on the East Coast in Patterson. Um, she pioneered some of the tactics that the Wobblies would use to great effect, right? The idea of having speakers on multiple street corners at the same time to kind of frustrate efforts to arrest them, um, to fill up the jails, to issue these calls for recruitment for hobos to come from around the country to come and defend free speech on top of a soapbox. So these were really dramatic and important free speech fights, but they were also violent. I mean, they would get hosed, they would get beaten, um, they would get dragged by their hair and their arms off the soapbox. Um, there were wobblies who were lynched. Frank Little was a dear friend of Elizabeth Gurley Flynn. He was lynched. Uh, Joe Hill, who coined the phrase, uh, the rebel girl for her, was executed by firing squad for allegedly killing a grocery store owner. Um, so the violence was perpetrated in a lot of different ways. And yeah, then in, in the middle of that was the rebel girl. And again, we have an example of how she used her femininity um, to great uh, effect. So, so, you know, in these free speech fights, you, there would be all kinds of violence visited on the, the wobblies who were getting up to protest um, the passage of laws that prohibited street speaking with a labor message. Um, they, they were, you know, these cities like Spokane and Missoula and all over the place, they were fine with preachers coming into town and, and you know, uh, encouraging working people to be docile and wait for their reward in the hereafter or presidential candidates. But once the IWW got up and preached their gospel of radical revolution, uh, that was not allowed. And, uh, and Elizabeth Gurley Flynn knew that she had an advantage in being a, a young, um, attractive woman. So they would not dare visit physical violence on her um, because that was you know the the, the era of chivalry um, so that was that was an advantage that she exploited I think quite well so she could get up and do these things and she would not be beaten on she could issue this call to have her uh, you know for for hobos to come from around the country to protect girly Flynn from the evil police and business interests in town uh, and I think she was brilliant in her use of that um, you know, sort of turning, if you will, patriarchy on its head and exploiting it as a way to advocate for working people, men and women. Um, but you're absolutely right. I think most people don't appreciate um, how violent U.S. labor history is, how much blood was spilled and how many people gave their lives in the struggle for working class liberation. And I think you mentioned the very sort of revolutionary politics, the IWW. And part of that definitely was about the role of women struggle 
but also the inclusive nature of the organization for women, but also for people with different races as well. So, and those politics were really central to Flynn's politics. Could you maybe say a little bit about that, about that inclusive anti-racist politics? Absolutely. Uh, you know, one of the reasons why I think it's it's a shame, and I, and I know we want to talk about this um, a, a little bit later, but one of the reasons why it's such a shame that she's not better known is that in so many ways, she is such a contemporary, an activist that contemporary uh, people can, can really uh, relate to. Um, she joined the IWW because it was audacious. I mean, think about it, she was 16, right? And here was this union that said, unlike the American Federation of Labor, which only wanted to organize skilled workers, white workers, American workers, the IWW said, if you work, we'll organize you. We'll organize you know, people born here will organize immigrants, will organize transient workers, hobos as they uh, affectionately called them, will organize blacks, will organize uh, women, will organize anybody who wants to be organized. And that was a very appealing to her. Um, as, a, as a young person, her, uh, her home was filled with activists like James Connolly, for example, who instilled in her the, or helped her, I think, to really I don't know that he instilled it in her, but who really helped her to appreciate the extent to which the struggle against colonialism, the struggle against racism, uh, the struggle against imperialism was intimately tied up with the struggle for working class liberation in the US and everywhere. So she made common cause uh, from the very beginning of her activist career with, with, you know, with with people in the struggle against racism and the struggle against imperialism in the struggle against sexism. She did not believe that suffrage was going to set women free. Um, she actually gave several speech where she said, you know, we don't, we don't wanna be the tail on the suffrage kite. I, I can't imagine myself going to a number of striking women who are barely earning enough to help feed their families and saying, don't worry, when suffrage comes, everything will be okay. Um, but she came to see later in her career that uh, that suffrage was an important tool, that political electoral politics were important tools of the struggle. But from the very beginning, she understood that um, a struggle to liberate working class people had to be simultaneously a struggle to liberate women, a struggle, struggle to liberate blacks, a struggle to liberate anyone who is suffering the yoke of imperialist oppression anywhere. Um, and she continued that throughout her life. Her, uh, her anti-imperialist work is, is I think, uh, underappreciated and really important. Again, it was shaped by her relationship with Connolly um, and uh, her relationship with Jim Larkin, her support for the Irish freedom struggle. Um, and in New York uh, in the 1920s, the struggle for, or actually around the time of World War One and into the 1920s, the struggle for Irish independence and Irish, uh, you know, the creation of an Irish, uh, uh, free Irish nation was an inspiration to black activists, um, to Indian activists, to Mexican activists, and, and Flynn was there. You know, she, um, she founded an organization in 1918 to advocate for uh, labor activists who were being persecuted under the Espionage Act that was passed, that Wilson advocated for, and that was passed in the U.S. during World War I to tamp down on dissent. And she recognized that that law was used to imprison radical labor activists, so really any labor activist who kind of stepped outside the zone of acceptable behavior. But it was also used to tamp down anti-imperialism. And so in the offices of the Workers' Defense Union, which was, were right off of Union Square in a building called the People's House, um, she provided office space to um, Indian anti-imperialists, the Friends of Freedom for India. Um, and she um, tells of, you know, uh, of the linkages uh, that she made between the Irish independence struggle and the struggle for independence in India. So she attended conferences. She, um, she advocated for Indian activists through the Workers' Defense Union. She advocated for the Magone brothers, uh, who were Mexican uh, anti-imperialist activists. And she was a staunch supporter of figures like A. Philip Randolph and Chandler Owen, who published uh, uh, The Messenger, a radical newspaper that was suppressed under the Espionage Act that called for uh, black liberation, and even at times, um, uh, Randolph, I believe it was Randolph who used the the, um, the expression "the black and tans" to refer to uh, forces that were brutalizing um, black activists in the U.S. So making that connection 
to Irish anti-colonial activists. So it's a, it's a wonderful moment and she is absolutely in the middle of it. I mean, she sees no contradiction between what Indian activists were doing and what Irish activists were doing to free themselves from oppression and what she was doing to uh, free working people in the US. She was an internationalist and an anti-imperialist and an anti-racist to the bone um, and never gave that up. Um, I, I mean, you know, continuing into the 30s, she's an anti-fascist into the 40s. She's an anti-lynching activist and anti, um, uh, she comes out against the poll tax, which is a tax to keep Blacks Americans from voting. Um, she's an activist against police brutality. Uh, she, she even articulates, um, there's a word in, in US politics and culture, I don't know if it's popular in Scotland, but it's very popular here, intersectionality. Yep. And it's yep. basically a concept that says that, you know, that there are intersection, intersecting uh, identities and categories of social categories, and these are also sites of intersecting oppressions. And it was popularized, the idea was popularized, so the story goes, by the Kambahi River Collective, which is a group of radical Black feminists in Boston. Um, and then Kimberly Crenshaw, who was a legal scholar, uh, coined the term. But in 1948, in an article she wrote for Political Affairs, which was a communist journal, she writes about the triple interlocking oppressions of Black women. She would use the expression Negro women at the time, that they are exploited and oppressed as women, as Blacks, and as uh, working class people. So I mean, she's ahead of the curve here, right? She's talking about intersectionality before the concept even ex exists in public discourse. Um, and that that's that's her in a nutshell that's her throughout her career to the very end um and i mean it's interesting because that period where she's first involved politically is an incredible period for working class history and for revolutionary politics and the first world war of course is one of the major events yes that causes all the problems on the left and for different organizations but Flynn is very clear, she's against the war. She's with people like Connolly, Eugene Debs, Rosa Luxemburg, Lenin, et cetera. And that, but that period where you mentioned the Espionage Act, the Red Scare, I mean, that is a sort of, it's a, in some ways a turning point, the IWW sort of founder at that time, because she's involved with all these people, Debs, Connolly, Big Bill Haywood, Emma Goldman. But can you maybe say a little bit about the sort of, the differences that emerged then during that period at the First World War, Red Scare, Espionage Act, when her and Bill Haywood and the IWW have a bit of a, bit of a disagreement. A bit of a falling bit out, a yes, fall. they do, yeah. Um, yeah, so so Flynn's very active in the IWW um, and up up into the period of, of World War One, And uh, as part of the, the government roundup of wobblies around the country, she is, she is, um, she is part of that. She is targeted or for that wave of, of repression. And she's specifically targeted for a pamphlet she wrote on sabotage. Um, and it was a pamphlet she wrote, you know, years before. It was a, you know, a tactic that she had not really thought a lot about since, since Patterson and, and after. Um, but she was rounded up. And Haywood's strategy was um, that the Wobblies would all stand trial together. Right, and that was a, the, kind of riffing on what what the IWW had done during the free speech fights. That we would will just you know overwhelm the justice system, and Flynn um, had a different tactic. She she wanted uh, she wanted them to advocate for severance of their trials so that everybody is tried separately because that she thought would be the more effective tactic. Um, Haywood disagreed, and they had a falling out about that. They also had a falling out about, you know, the fundraising for defense campaigns for Wobblies and who would control the funds and how hierarchical uh, the organization of that of those and other campaigns would be. So there are lots of kind of lots of things, but um, kind of I think the the real moment where you see this real break is with the um, the roundups, the arrests, and the indictments under the Espionage Act. For the IWW, which crushes the union. I mean, they they still exist. They organize Amazon workers now, but they never really um, they never really had a lot of numbers anyway. But they had a lot of presence, and that really kind of cuts them off at the knees. Um, Flynn gets out of uh, her. She isn't. She never comes to trial because um, she's very well connected. She's American born, so unlike some of the others who are rounded up uh, under the Espionage Act, she has no fear of deportation. Uh, what we would say, and she used that. We would say now she used her privilege 
uh, to help other people. And she was doing that again before there was a word. She knew as someone who was um, not subject to deportation that she could advocate for others. And that was what she did. She, she used her connections. She contacted uh, Joseph Tumulty, who was uh, uh, in, you know, um, an assistant to Woodrow Wilson, pleaded for herself as a, I gotta admit, it's a little bit painful to read. I'm a mother. I care for my own mother and my son. How could I be an, a revolutionary activist? Of course, you know, she's full of beans, but, but she, she succeeds in, um, in getting, uh, in, in removing herself from the immediate danger. She's never brought to trial. She promises that she will not advocate against the war uh, publicly, which she never did again. What she did though, instead, I think was more important is she founded the Workers' Defense Union in 1918. So her thinking is I got, I'm free. And now my work is to get other people free. Haywood in contrast, um, and if you if you hear a little animosity in my voice, it's because there is some Haywood who you know who excoriates her for thinking only of herself. Um, it you know does not uh, advocate for severance uh, of his trial from the others, but he also never stands trial. He jumps bail and flees to the Soviet Union. So you know she stays and does the work. He leaves and he and he dies uh, in the Soviet Union. So I, you know I, I'm a little. Um, troubled by the criticism of her for doing that and the kind of lionization of Haywood for not, because in the end, she's the one who kept her, you know, nose to the grindstone. Um, and she did incredible work. The uh, Workers' Defense Union was an affiliate of the ACLU. Um, in fact, it was founded before the ACLU when the ACLU was, a, a you know, in kind of an incipient uh, civil liberties organization. And she did incredible work, again, advocating. She advocated for Lovett Fort Whiteman, who is a, a black communist. She advocated for the Magone brothers. I mean, all the people I said earlier, women, people, Debs, I mean, people you've heard of, people you've never heard of. And her logic was, um, you know, and, and Sacco and Vanzetti, the Workers' Defense Union came out early, was the published the first pamphlet in English about Sacco and Vanzetti, the first press release in English about Sacco and Vanzetti. She was the liaison between the liberal community and the anarchists in Boston who were advocating. She was the first American to see Sacco and Vanzetti in prison. Um, and her thinking was, uh, people like Debs are really important, but, but people like Debs have lots of advocates. We need to find and, and lift up the unknowns, the people who have no organization to advocate for them. Those are the people who need us the most. And that's what she did um, as the organizer of the Workers' Defense Union. And that might seem like, oh, wait, you're contradicting yourself because everybody knows Sacco and Vanzetti. But the truth is when she first began advocating for them, no one knew who they were. Um, and she was phenomenal. You know, There's an account of a speech she gave in the neighborhood in Brockton where they were picked up. And she uh, addresses this crowd and uh, John Nicholas Bethel, who's a, a labor reporter, uh, Federate, he worked for the Federated Press, which was a labor uh, press, um, kind of like UPI and Reuters, but very labor themed. And Bethel has this eyewitness account that, that he uh, constructed and said, you know, she started talking to this crowd and, and nobody, was sympathetic to Sacco and Vanzetti. And by the time she was done, they were cheering the anarchists and booing the police and, and making contributions. And that's the kind of um, continued agitation that she did and then you know, lifted up for other people to do that transformed them into internationally known figures. But when she started, they were completely unknown outside of that anarchist circle. Um, and that was her commitment. And something you said there strikes me as quite significant that she's American. So people like Emma Goldman and what of you are, depart, are uh, deported, but also the, it, it's, it's possible for the state at that period to say that communism, some alien mm -hmm. ideology being imported into America, it's un-American, but then Gurley Flynn is American. She is the rebel girl. So th th that's something quite significant. I think during that period, do, do you agree? Do you think that is quite important the way I think it's difficult for us to imagine what it was like at that period, but a lot of the leading people, any opportunity, the state wanted to deport them. Yeah, you know, it's funny when you say it's difficult for us to imagine. I sometimes find it easier to imagine yeah. 1917 <laughs> than 2021 because my brain is so often there. <laughs> but you're absolutely right. I mean, I, I have a lot of respect for Emma Goldman, um, but, uh, you know, Goldman was vulnerable as um, as uh, an immigrant, and she was deported uh, with Berkman on the Buford, right? The Soviet Ark, um, they called it, uh, or the Russian, I think it was the Soviet Ark. Anyway, um, yeah, and, and Flynn was not. She was not uh, vulnerable in that way. Um, and, and 
she definitely exploited that. As I said, she, what we would say now, she used her privilege, but, but it's also symbolically very important as you rightly pointed out because she gave a lie to the argument that we don't, we don't give birth to radicals here in the US, right? If people are radicals, it's because they, you know, they came in from Europe that way. We know, and you know, even Sacro and Vanzetti, they weren't radicals when they got here. They were radicalized by what they witnessed here in the US. But the argument nonetheless was made, well, they were Italians, of course, they're gonna, you know, subscribe to these alien ideologies and in their case, anarchism. But you couldn't say that with Flynn. She's born in New Hampshire. She lived in the Bronx, right? She tried and she loved the US. She loved traveling around. She loved the West. I mean, she loved when she was out in Missoula and Spokane, it was just extraordinarily beautiful and, and really moving to her. And so, you know, I, I wrote the foreword to uh, the reissued uh, prison memoir that she wrote when she was at the Alderson Federal Penitentiary for Women. And the first sentence of it is Elizabeth Gurley Flynn is a bona fide American radical. Um, so is the IWW founded in Chicago, right? I mean, the, the IWW is a global organization as the name suggests, um, but it's a very American organization at the same time. And, and that's Flynn, I mean, she's an internationalist. Uh, later on, you know, she travels to the Soviet Union, she actually dies in the Soviet Union, but she is first and foremost an American radical. And, you know, the, the left in the US right now, there's a lot of rightly so disillusionment with the, the American project and you know the ideals uh, that the US uh, articulates, we so frequently fall short of them. But Flynn is one of those radicals um, who never ceded the language and the symbolism of America. When she was up on a soapbox in the free speech fights, she's quoting the Declaration of Independence. When she's you know leading the campaign to free imprisoned radicals under the, you know, arrested and indicted under the Espionage Act, she's using the First Amendment. She's using the language of Lincoln and Jefferson, and she refuses to let go of that. I mean, this is her political tradition as much as it is the tradition of those who wish to oppress working people. She never gives up one ounce of ground. Um, and so I think that's a really important point uh, that, you know, we can't say that she's a foreign import because she's as American as apple pie. And there's, you mentioned our, our second autobiography. She very helpfully has two autobiographies, one dealing with the rebel girl years and then the other one dealing mainly with her period as a political prisoner. But if, if we, and it might not be right, I'm interested in if you think it is right, but there's, there's a break in between where she goes to Portland and she takes a break from politics completely. And is it, do you think it is right to see that as two separate sort of periods of her life or is there a continuity there right through? It's a sort of, I mean, I'd be interested in that, but because the second she re-emerges then as a, as a communist, very, mm. very, very much to the fore of the Communist Party in America. So what do you make, what do we make of a break in Portland as well in terms of, I mean, obviously she was having a difficult time politically, things were difficult, personally things were difficult for her. But what, what do we make of that? That was quite a prolonged break she had in Portland and then she re-emerges as a communist. Yeah, I think uh, personally, yeah, I mean, her, the love of her life sleeps with her sister and they have a child. That's a tough pill to swallow. Um, politically, yeah, we, you know, the, the, the she, I think, um, is, is intrigued and increasingly drawn to the Communist Party, particularly when they, when they emerge out of that, that uh, third period phase where they're like, oh, the revolution's coming any minute and there's all kinds of factionalism and everything. Um, she's attracted to those ideas in the 20s, but not to the organization because it's really kind of a mess in the 20s. Um, and then of course, Sacco and Vanzetti are executed and that's gotta be a blow. I mean, she worked for years uh, on the case. Um, yeah, I do think it's fair. And Flynn, I thought of her life as, I mean, the first, uh, you know, the Rebel Girl and autobiography, My First Life. Right, and she also changes ideologically. So when she's a uh, wobbly, she's a syndicalist, right? She, you know, she's not she's not advocating for suffrage. She's not endorsing candidates. She's not, at, you know, she's she's using her relationships to get out of uh, being in jail so that she could advocate for others. But she's not she's not participating in politics, particularly electoral politics, in any significant way. Um, but then we see a shift, right? She's in Portland for about 10 years. Um, her family and her friends back East are really concerned. Uh, Carlo Tresca is concerned at one point. He even, you know, he says, look, I can get you a job uh, with the anti-fascist Alliance of North America if you wanna come back. And she, you know, no, she can't deal with it. Um, she doesn't wanna deal with it, but she's changing also politically. So she jumps back in, she comes back East in the thirties and it's a perfect time for her. It's the, the period of the popular front 
and Flynn is an alliance builder. I mean, she, the, the organizations and the individuals that she gets to sign on to the campaigns of Free Sacco and Vanzetti, for example, is nothing short of extraordinary. You know, anarchists to the AFL, um, and that's, for anybody who knows the history of labor on the left, that's a huge chasm that she can bridge. Um, she's really good at that. And so the Popular Front period appeals to her. Um, this notion that we're going to unite in, in our efforts against fascism. She's been an anti-fascist since uh, the 19, early 1920s. In fact, she's one of the first uh, English speaking members of Antifa uh, when it's mostly a bunch of Italian radicals that nobody's paying much attention to because, oh, Mussolini, isn't he this dashing person? Oh, those Italians, don't they need somebody to teach them law and order? And she sees right through it. She sees it as an existential threat to democracy. She sees the relationship between racism and fascism. She calls out the KKK. Uh, as an American fascist organization. And really not many other English speakers in the US are doing that. Um, and so the CP in the 1930s is, uh, you know, they are absolutely anti-fascist up until the Nazi Soviet pact where they're still anti-fascist, but they kind of mute the rhetoric, right? Um, and, and that appeals to her as well. Um, it's the, it is like the IWW was when she first joined, it's where the cool kids are going. Um, and she is, also, I think it's important, the personal aspect of this. You know, she her, her life kind of falls apart in 26. She goes out West, she's in this relationship with Marie Aqui, who's a fascinating figure, um, but it's, it just, it's not where she wants to be, but it's where she goes after a while, right? But it's where she needed to be to lick her wounds. She sees all this stuff happening in the sit down strikes, all this stuff happening um, in labor and in radical circles and she wants to be there. So she comes back to New York and she is warmly received and she has community again. And that's really important for her. Um, she takes a lot of flack for it. You know, she writes a column in the, uh, in the Daily Worker soon after she joins the CP where she met, um, she met an acquaintance who uh, said, oh, you know, where are you coming from? And she said, oh, I just gave a speech. And oh, what was the speech for? Oh, the Communist Party. And and just, he rips into her. So she pays a price for that um, because, you know, leftists who are anti-communist, either liberals or anarchists or socialists or syndicalists, um, they don't understand. Um, but if you understand her psyche and her, you know, all the things that came before, I think there is no way she wouldn't have joined. She wants to be in the struggle. This is the train that's leaving the station and she is on it. And her first, um, her first public event, just to add one final thing, as a, as a, as a member of the Communist Party, it's a rally um, in support of the uh, Abraham Lincoln Brigade, the volunteers who went to fight fascism in Spain. So her, her coming out, her debut is at an anti-fascist rally. Perfect. Yeah, perfect. And I mean, I think that's what I was actually going to say. That, is, that does seem to be just the, the perfect moment for her to re-emerge and, and Spanish Civil War, uh, Franco, fascism's on the rise in Europe. And there she is talking about the National Brigades and the Abraham Lincoln Battalion. And uh, and I mean, we hear talk of fascism all the time now, obviously. It's like it seems to re-emerge every 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 political crisis is if the Trump's a fascist or something, something mm -hmm. else a fascist. But I mean... There we have someone like Gilly Flynn, who was anti-fascist to her core from very early on. So, I mean, in terms of if we can just try and think, it's, I mean, that's a great lesson for people now, though, to think of that sort of continuity and understanding a politics at the very beginning all the way through. And maybe say a little bit about that, about anti-fascism and just how central it was to our politics. Yeah, uh, she, as I mentioned, you know, she's one of the first English speakers to come out against Mussolini. And, and again, using her privilege, she baited him. Um, in her, her partner at the time was Carlo Tresca, who was constantly baiting Mussolini in, in Il Martello, right? The, the hammer, his, his newspaper. And Flynn did the same. Uh, you know, she would, she, uh, there was one piece she wrote called uh, Mussolini's Finger in America's Pie. Um, she, she constantly uh, hurled epithets at him. She recognized that fascism was not just a threat to Italy, but it was a threat to democracy around the globe. She also recognized that fascism is a product of capitalism, um, that fascism involves the suppression of labor activism. You know, it's, it take, in, in the, the Germans took the name 
right? National socialism, but they were not. I mean, that was that was where the similarities uh, began and ended. And lots of people, you know, people who don't know have said, well, but Nazism was just a form of socialism. And no, in fact, it was not. That was a kind of a, a bait and switch rhetorically. And she understood that. Um, she understood that even when uh, Mussolini came out as he did uh, in support of Sacco and Vanzetti, um, his reasons for doing so were self-serving. I mean, and that was okay, you know, if, it, if it's gonna get these guys out of prison, I'm, I'm not gonna say don't do it. But, you know, it was a way to kind of uh, be the, the advocate for Italians around the globe. But as Flynn pointed out, yeah, and he's executing Sacco and Vanzetti's left and right in Italy. I mean, so she never lost sight of, you know, this is not an ideology that is friendly to uh, worker organizing, to building worker power. This is not an ideology that is uh, friendly to people of color of any sort. Um, as, as I said, she, she saw the, uh, the KKK as an American fascist organization. Um, she was a staunch supporter of the international brigades. She was a friend of La Passionaria, Dolores Ibaruri, um, and, a, and a great admirer of hers. And she remained an anti-fascist. The thing that I, I, if I could have dinner with her, which, you know, when people say, oh, if you could say with any historical person, who would it be? And, you know, I would say Elizabeth Gurley Flynn and, and, and half the time people say, who's that? Um, but when, when I think about having dinner with her, I think one question I would love to ask her would be the Nazi Soviet pact. Because here, you know, all of a sudden we have to go from seeing the, the fascist aggression in Europe as like, this is what we are all about right? The anti-fascism. We are all about protecting the Soviet Union and the rest of the world. And then all of a sudden, the Nazi-Soviet pact, and now it's about the imperial war, imperialist war, right? Now, now FDR is an imperialist, and we need to tamp down the, the imperialist war effort. Um, that must have been really hard for a committed anti-fascist, uh, for all, everyone in the party. I think we underestimate how difficult that must have been. But for someone like Flynn, who like anti-fascism is like oxygen to her, right? This is this is who she is, this is what she does. And there's evidence even during that period before uh, you know, the pact falls apart um, between when it's signed and when it falls apart. You know, there are a number of nefarious laws that are proposed in the US. The Smith Act, of course, is passed. That's the act that that ultimately takes down the party um, and its leadership, including Flynn. But also there's another bill, the Hobbes Concentration Act bill. And it's a bill that basically would have set up concentration camps for immigrants in the US who couldn't be deported for whatever reason, like the situation at home did not make them deportable. And she called it out as a fascist law. Even during that period of the Nazi Soviet pact, she, you know, she still continued to be an anti-fascist, but she was also a loyal member of the party. And so she was very careful about how she constructed her anti-fascism. But again, you know, once the, the pact dissolves, once once uh, Hitler invades um, the Soviet Union, um, all bets are off, and and she's you know back. I can't say back in the saddle because she never really got out of the saddle. But I think it opened up as it did for everyone in the party that that you know that sigh of relief, and then that opening up again uh, of the of the uh, possibility for anti-fascist activism, which I mean she remains a consistent foe until she died really and um, could you maybe talk a little bit about this period in the second world war is quite interesting in the sense of how the politics of that plays out with laws that are brung in ostensibly to target nazis but then of course end up targeting the left but also for flynn herself she's a founding member of the aclu but then the aclu expel her so this is somebody who, as we say, is anti-fascist to the core, has been involved in anti-fascism longer than most of the people who are now anti-fascist during the Second World War. And yet the ACLU turn around and say to her, no, your politics are just as bad as the fascist politics. So that must have been, right. I mean, so can we maybe say a little bit about what was going on there? Yeah, so, um... So there's a period at the the end of the 1930s, uh, like 38 to 41, I think it is. It's called. It, historians have dubbed it a little Red Scare because it's not the full flowering of the Red Scare post World War II. But there's uh, an increasing uh, tide of anti anti communism around the U.S. Um, it, it, there's nothing yet at the federal level, right at the beginning of that period. But but at the local level, um, you, there's a lot of of anti communism um, and. Uh, Flynn is traveling around the country giving speeches about uh, fat anti-fascist uh, speeches. And in one case, um, she is harassed so uh, 
loudly that she has to stop speaking. In another case, tear gas is thrown into the hall where she's speaking with, you know, there are children there and she writes about this in the Daily Worker, um, but she's undaunted, right? This is, she, she keeps going. She's like the, you know, I don't know if you, those images of the Energizer rabbit, you wind her up and she just keeps going. So she's, she refuses to, um, to capitulate, but but she can't, she can't halt, right, this, this rising tide. I mean, she can, she can keep going, but that doesn't mean it's not going to affect her at all. So we've, there are a number of people on the, the um, executive board of the ACLU who are part of this. They are increasingly concerned about the organization's reputation, its ability to fundraise, and they are concerned about what they perceive to be um, the threat of the Soviet Union. Um, you know, the, the show trials, information about the show trials is coming out and uh, that is problematic. Um, and then the signing of the Nazi Soviet pact kind of green lights them. I mean, it's a tidy argument to say, oh, well, the signing of the Nazi Soviet pact, but this was happening before then. And this was just the excuse that, that um, people on the board were looking for, I think, to purge communists. Um, and when the resolution is passed uh, that stipulates that no person who is either a fascist or a communist um, can be on the uh, executive board of the ACLU. Um, she's incensed and says, I, I, you think I'm going to resign and I'm not. Um, and so she forces them to try her. Uh, the trial has to be postponed because um, it, her, her son, uh, Fred, dies tragically of cancer. I mean, he, she, he, he tells her he has cancer and then within weeks he's dead. And so they have to move the trial from March to May. Um, they try her, it's, uh, a, there's a tie and John Haynes Holmes breaks the tie. And so by one vote, she is expelled. Um, and it's a painful process for her. Um, but but it, it's, it, I don't think it's one that she was completely, uh, that was completely unexpected because in addition to the rise in anti-communism and you know Morris Ernst, figures like Morris Ernst on the board who we later found out was collaborating with uh, Hoover uh, and the FBI, uh, John Haynes Holmes. These are people who are really worried about respectability and, and uh, really bothered that she won't do the right thing and step down. But there's also a struggle about what civil liberties are. Um, I think this is the less well-known part of that, that struggle. Um, so Flynn, for example, is very supportive of the sit down as a strike tactic and other members of the ACLU board are not, right? This is an infringement on property rights. So there's a split. She's also very supportive when um, organizers at a Ford plant are brutally beaten by Ford's thugs. Um, she is absolutely uh, on board with calling out the methods that Ford and other um, uh, business owners use to suppress organizing. And other members of the ACLU board are, are starting to embrace this kind of non-ideological version of free speech. So, well, we, we can't tamp down on the free speech of bosses any more than we can, we can uh, suppress the free speech of workers, right? We need to be equal. And that, that so there's an, there's an ideological rift. When the ACLU was founded, it was founded as an organization to protect the rights of labor activists. The cause we serve is labor. That's a quote from, uh, uh, the founder of the ACLU, Roger Baldwin. Baldwin and Friend were very close. As soon as the ACLU was founded, they went on a speaking tour around the country. She spoke about anti-fascist and labor rights. He spoke about civil liberties generally. They start to kind of go their separate ways. And, um, and so it's a combination, I think, of a rising tide of anti-communism, personal animosity between her and other people on the board, and then these very different interpretations of free speech. But the important thing I think to note, and I deal with this at great length in, in the book that I'm, I'm finishing up is Flynn didn't change. It's the ACLU that changed. And they argued, well, you joined the Communist Party and now we can't trust you uh, to defend the constitution. And she said, I've been defending the constitution since you, most of you even cared about the first amendment, right? I've been doing this longer than just about anybody here. And can you point to one moment where I put the Soviet constitution uh, which she actually quotes at length and says it doesn't suppress uh, civil liberties, or I put the interests of any other place on the planet before First Amendment rights in the US, and they couldn't. All right, so this really wasn't about, oh my gosh, now you serve a foreign power and a foreign ideology. This was, we don't want to lose donations. We want to be respectable. We don't like you anymore. And we are embracing uh, a different version of free speech than we had in the past. We are moving towards civil rights. Uh, we are moving towards a value neutral version of free speech. Um, and Flynn says that's, that's, that's 
that's insane. You know, Henry Ford and the people who work at his plants have are in such different material circumstances that to assume that that he and they share the same access to a platform or the same enforcement mechanisms for First Amendment rights is ludicrous, um, and they disagree. And I suppose with the ACLU being prepared to treat Flynn and communists in that way, that in many ways legitimizes other moves that are taking place against the left at the same time, including the Smith Act then and ultimately the trials. Can you maybe say a little bit about that? Because um, Smith himself, who proposes the act, is a Democrat, is that right? And the espionage, of course, is Wilson. So there's a sort of pattern developing there as well, where Democrats bring in legislation which are targeting the right and actually end up being used against the left. So, but in terms of Flynn herself, maybe say a little bit about how she got caught up in this myth act and her imprisonment, as you mentioned, where the second autobiography deals with. Yeah, sure. Um, so I love my girl deeply, but one of the disappointments I have is that when the Smith Act was being debated, she, as far as I know, and if any of the listeners have evidence otherwise, I want to be corrected send it to me. Uh, she did not speak out against it. Um, she spoke out, as I mentioned, against the Hobbes uh, bill, which would have created these detention camps. That was actually an initial provision of the Smith Act. It was removed um, in debates in Congress. Uh, but yeah, it was, it was proposed by um, a Democrat. Um, some of the fiercest opposition, by the way, to the New Deal came from Democrats. Uh, this illusion that Republicans are always the bad guys and Democrats are always the good guys, it's just not true. Um, so uh, the Smith Act was proposed as a way to protect the US from uh, nefarious activities on the part of either the right, you know, Nazis. There was evidence that the Nazis were, there was some evidence that there was Nazi infiltration. It was, I mean, it was a, an absolutely, uh, I mean, the evidence was there, but the, 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 um, the Nazi infiltrators were inept and the, 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 the trial went nowhere. Um, but like most laws in the US that target both left and right um, subversion, this one was primarily directed at at the left. Um, just like no spies were convicted under the Espionage Act, there were no significant uh, indictments of uh, fascists under the Smith Act. Um, Flynn did not speak out against it. However, um, it's kind of an, a, a legend that nor did the Communist Party. That's not true. Uh, the Communist Party was very active in their opposition, very vocal in their opposition to the Smith Act. They did not, however, testify in Congress. And I'm guessing part of why they didn't was um, for the optics of it, right? They, they um, to have Earl Browder, who's president of the CPUSA, I mean, um, uh, General Secretary of the CPUSA at the time, um, it may have felt that it would have done more harm than good to the opposition. Um, but they wrote editorials. Uh, they pressured Wils uh, Roosevelt not to sign the law. Um, but he did, of course. And the first, uh, and the only, by the way, the only congressman who spoke out against the law and who actually led a campaign unsuccessful to repeal it was Vito Marcantonio, the other socialist congressperson from the Bronx before AOC. Um, actually, he was from East Harlem. Sorry, from New York. Um, but uh, um, the first Smith Act prosecutions were directed towards the Trotskyists, who were the enemies of communists. Uh, and uh, sadly, the the CP did not stand up for the Trotskyists. They they you know they were very deeply involved in the leadership of a Teamster uh, local, and the the a number of anti-communists in the Teamster local wanted them out. And so they actually colluded with the federal government to provide evidence uh, that would um, that would allow for an indictment of uh, a number of Trotskyists in the union uh, under the Smith Act. And it was a it was a, an indictment of uh, that re rested on books, basically literature um, to make the case that. And in fact, they didn't even have to make the case that the Trotskyists were conspiring to overthrow the government by force, because that's what the Smith Act did. It, it made it illegal to, um, to advocate the overthrow of the US government by force. And it also provided for uh, uh, registration of all uh, resident aliens in the US, which then of course was the ammunition that was needed to round up the Japanese later on. But anyway, um, the, the prosecution attempted to make the point that, that there's a difference between um, advocating something and belonging to an organization, right? And that um, if there was the, that clear and present danger had to be uh, demonstrated, right? That they actually pro pro posed a clear and present danger to the social order and the government of the US. And that was struck down. 
So all they had to prove was that the Trotskyists had conspired to advocate the overthrow of the government. What does that mean? Right? It means whatever you want it to mean. So the prosecution was successful in uh, securing convictions. Um, again, Flynn did not speak out against the law. Um, it was less than a decade later that uh, the law was turned on the leadership of the Communist Party. Um, and she chaired, uh, she was very involved in the Smith Act defense campaign um, and was very vocal in advocating for the rights of all Americans, whatever their uh, politics to hold whatever ideas they wanted and to be members in whatever organizations they wanted. Uh, when she was indicted under the second uh, round of indictments, she and Claudia Jones, who is a, a, a younger woman, a very dear friend of Flynn's, a black uh, activist, and uh, a number of others, um, she acted as her own counsel. It was really difficult, and she, she talks about this in the prison memoir. It was really difficult for communists indicted under the Smith Act to get legal counsel um, because uh, you know, people feared that their reputations would be ruined. Either they were themselves anti-communist or they feared uh, being red baited um, and losing professional status and uh, clients and possibly being stripped of their, you know, of their credentials and so it was really awful. And she advocated for herself and gave uh, what I think amounted to a brilliant defense um, of the rights of, of uh, civil liberties, uh, of, the, of the need for civil liberties for communists and all um, political actors uh, in the US. Um, but to no avail, of course, she was uh, convicted and, and served time at the Alderson Federal Penitentiary, um, where she considered herself a political prisoner. And I think that's an important point. Uh, from the very beginning, from 1918, when she founded the Workers' Defense Union, until she died, Flynn argued uh, regularly that the U.S. needed to uh, create a political prisoner status, to recognize that people are thrown into jail, sometimes because they commit antisocial acts, you know, they commit acts of violence for no good reason. Um, although she did hold, and if you read uh, My Life as a Political Prisoner, her memoir, she, she has very forward-thinking ideas about who commits crime. Um, at, you know, about substance abuse as a disease, not a moral failure, um, way before her time, about poverty and the despair that comes with poverty. So even people who commit, you know, actual criminal acts, very often it's the system that fails them, not them failing the system. But she also observes, I think rightly, that some people are tossed in jail because the government decides to criminalize whatever politics they have and then say, oh, see, they're criminals. And she said, you know, we need to recognize that there's such a thing as political prisoners. Um, the U.S. has never done that, and uh, when she was in Alderson, she insisted that she and the other members of the party, Claudia Jones and, and others uh, before her and after her, well, no, not after her, but before her, uh, they were political prisoners, and that was, um, I think that was a source of strength for her and a source of pride that she had been convicted and imprisoned for her political beliefs, and she would not ever back down from those beliefs. Yeah, absolutely. Fascinating. And, and she spent over two years in prison. Is that, is that right? Over two years in prison. Claudia Jones is then um, uh, deported as well. Is that, is that Yes, correct? yes. There have been efforts to deport Jones in the 40s and Flynn was uh, an outspoken advocate for, for her. But yes, uh, Claudia Jones is... Um, is uh, released, she's not well, she's unhealthy. Um, and there's a very poignant passage in uh, the, the prison memoir where Flynn writes about when Claudia Jones left and how lonely she was after that. She helped, they both wrote poetry, Jones's poetry, sorry, Elizabeth Gurley Flynn, but Jones's poetry I think is, is better than Flynn's. Uh, Flynn had a lot of talents and her poetry was okay, but Jones's poetry is really good. And, um, and, and uh, Elizabeth Gurley Flynn helps her to memorize it because she can't, take the sheets of paper out with her. So she helps her to memorize it so that um, it's not lost. Um, and, and the two were very close and um, and yeah, Jones is released first because she's unhealthy, but she's then deported and she does all kinds of incredible work um, on the other side of the ocean. Yeah, yeah. And uh, and tell me just in terms of the second, the prison memoir, second autobiography referred to, I mean, Angela Davis mentions that as well because obviously race is a big issue in American society anyway at that period, but in the prison as well. And Flynn doesn't shy away from that at all. She's very vocal about it as she, as she would be. And Angela Davis gives a lot of credit in terms of recognizing that she was a, that she was ahead of the game and that she was also like a staunch defender of uh, rights. Uh, maybe say a little bit about that, because I think that's quite interesting because she comes, obviously she dies before the sort of black power period. But there is that connection there where Angela Davis and other people like that are, are reading Flynn. 
and are clearly recognizing a lot in it that they admire. Oh, I, you know, if she had been born a little later and or, or lived longer, she would have been hanging out with Angela Davis. She was, she, I mean, she was active with Paul Robeson. She would have been active with Angela Davis. Um, I think uh, Fred Hampton, uh, you know, I, I've no doubt um, black radical black activists who are inspired by um, the, the kind of politics, class politics that also inspired Flynn. But yeah, no, she's, it, it, the prison memoir, I think, is it, the Rebel Girl. Her autobi her first autobiography is, is, I think, much better known. But, but the prison memoir is, is in some ways, a, to me, a more interesting work. Um, and it's a, it's a call for prison reform way before anyone else was issuing a call for prison reform. Actually, when it was released, it got, it was not reviewed in, in most, most mainstream publications. Um, but it was reviewed, obviously, in, in, by the party and its publications and by more less mainstream publications. And social workers, progressive social workers, really saw value in it. And they encouraged each other to read it and had discussions about it and were really moved by her observations. As I mentioned, she saw uh, substance abuse as a disease and illness rather than a moral failing. And she was really perceptive in her observations about how prison functions. So she begins the memoir by talking about the militarization creep in prison and how they used the language of the military. They had uh, cast offs from, you know, from army uh, in terms of clothing, the, the, the clothing and the different utensils that they used. And so she saw how there was, because the Alderson Penitentiary was supposed to be kind of a, a pleasant place for women to go. But as Flynn noted, being unfree is being unfree. It doesn't matter if you're in, you know, in a, in a beautiful prison, it's still a prison. And, but she noticed how there was this increasing conflation between law enforcement and the military. Again, you know, very prescient. And she also saw um, the segregation of the prison and the uh, differential treatment that black uh, prisoners got, um, the, the racism of the white prison guards. Um, and interestingly, uh, two interesting things happened while she was in prison, a lot of interesting things happened, but two ironic and interesting things happened. One, she was asked to write uh, an article for 4th of July for the prison publication, which she found ironic. But the second, I think, ironic and interesting thing is, is when the prison was ordered to desegregate, the authorities within the prison uh, approached Flynn and Jones and other uh, communists um, and uh, said, would you please lead the desegregation efforts? Because as communists, you know how this stuff goes. You've been doing this for years. We don't know how to do it. So they actually enlisted the communists to desegregate or to help um, smooth the path to desegregation. And she was uh, very aware uh, how uh, most of the prisoners were or how many of the prisoners were people of what we would call people of color, right? Uh, Blacks, um, Latinas, uh, Puerto Rican political activists, um, anti-imperialists, right? She considered them fellow, she called them fellow politicals. Uh, and also, um, you know, the disparate treatment that they got. And she recognized that as a person who is connected to the party network, that she had privileges that they didn't. So she had her sister, Kathy, wrote to her all the time. Other, she had the party network to supply her with, um, you know, packages and letters and some money. And she would share this. Uh, she asked people, for example, to write her cards, to send her cards, but she would then um, give them to the other prisoners. So they had pretty things to hang on their walls. She would share whatever she had with the other prisoners. So again, what we would call using her privilege to help others. Um, but very, very conscious of the racism there and um, willing, I think at a lot at a time when a lot of uh, other women, white women uh, would not have been willing, willing to talk to the black prisoners, willing to listen to the black prisoners, willing to help them uh, with, uh, you know, to calling out the racism that they experience. I think her very close and very uh, mutually um, respectful relationship with Claudia Jones um, inspired uh, prisoners to see that she was a, a woman who could be trusted, a white woman who could be trusted. Um, so that's a really wonderful part of the memoir to, to read that. And I think the, the piece by Angela Davis, um, re really, it's wonderful to read because she recognizes that this is one of the few white women and, and the black prisoners trusted her because they saw that she was committed. This was a cause that she believed in. It, she was not performing this, right? She was, this was who she was. Yeah, no, I think I think right. I think that is a sort of important act of solidarity across, you know, barriers of color and you mm -hmm. know generations and whatever. Um, I mean, just one. I mean, 
we were just thinking about that period where she's in prison, she's a political prisoner, but she's an older woman by that stage. She's no rebel girl anymore, she's an older woman. But I suppose people listening to this won't be surprised to know that when she gets out, her politics are completely, you know, undimmed and she continues to be a political activist. She stands for the council in New York as a communist in 1957 or so, and she travels to the Soviet Union where she dies. So she continued to do the prison experience, even as an older woman suffering that. Didn't, it didn't make any difference to her. She got out and continued her activism as she had the rest of the rest of her life. So, and she dies in the Soviet Union. Maybe say a little bit about that. She's traveling there, but I mean, it becomes a big deal. She gets a state funeral in Red Square, etc. Yeah, she is also elected first female chair of the Amer of the Communist Party of the United States, right? And a, a lot of uh, people have looked at Flynn's communist years and said, well, she was, you know, she was a figurehead. She was a symbol. Um, and in some ways, she was. She was an important symbol. I mean, she allowed. Her presence in the Communist Party allowed the party to kind of tap into that legacy that we talked about earlier with the IWW, that here's a person who was involved in just about every major struggle, working class struggle, of the first half of the 20th century. And, and as a communist, she links the party to that tradition of struggle, um, of working class struggle that goes back to the founding of the IWW, right? So Lawrence Patterson, the free speech fights, Passaic, I mean, she's there, right? Um, and so that is an important symbol, but, but she's also, you know, if you read some of the memoirs, Steve Nelson, um, some of the other memoirs of, of um, party members, she plays an important role within the party as well. She, she kind of knits people together. Um, and Dorothy Healy, who is uh, a communist from California says one of the, the, the interesting things about Flynn was she didn't have to jockey for position in the party. She brought such a reputation in with her that she, she just kind of naturally, it was effortless for her, right? To be part of this culture. So she could be very generous um, to other people in the party, particularly women, she could mentor them. So as much, Along with all of the kind of public activist stuff she did, I think she played an important role within the party. Um, Nelson says, for example, that when he, he served in the Abraham Lincoln Brigades, when he left the party, it was really difficult. I mean, this was their life, right? This, was, this wasn't just what people did as activists. This was their social world. This is what kind of structured the way they lived their everyday lives. So leaving the party was a really big deal. And Steve Nelson, you know, when he was, uh, when he left, um, he said that one of the few people who actually came to visit and talk to him was Flynn. You know, who 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 kept the door open? Um, so she was very important internally in the party, um, but absolutely, you know, she she remains um, visible. She remains active. Her passport is is uh, rescinded, and she fights along with Apsecker. Paul Robeson had his passport uh, taken away, also, and she fights for her right to travel again. Um, and and interestingly, what she does when she travels is so she goes, she travels. You know, she went. Um, she traveled a few times. She, she never went to Ireland, which I always found kind of interesting. Um, but she she uh, does go to the Soviet Union. Uh, she goes to Eastern Europe. She uh, and she comes back and talks about what she sees in these countries. And so she's she's not just going for edification, right? Like, oh, I'm, this will enrich me as a person. She comes back and she's speaking about the rights of women, the rights of minorities in communist countries. And so she's using uh, her travel as a way to educate. Uh, and active, activate people. Um, she never stops being an activist. And uh, yeah, she's really well received in the Soviet Union. Uh, she dies there. Uh, she is given a state funeral, but um, as her first biographer, it's not a full-blown biography, but Roz Baxendahl writes, it, 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 there's something kind of poignant about that though, that she dies there um, because she's in, she is a quintessentially American activist. Her ashes are, back here. She's in the, the cemetery with the Haymarket Martyrs um, in Chicago. I actually uh, made a point of visiting there um, and her, her, her grave marker uh, refers to her as the rebel girl. Um, and that's, I think, where she belongs because uh, she saw great promise in the Soviet Union. And when others, you know, after 1956, when other people lost, lost, I mean, they became disillusioned. Um, whether she did in her, you know, deep down inside, I don't know, but she never um, stopped acting as if uh, she believed. And, and I think, I don't think she believed so much in the Soviet Union, but I think she believed in the ideals of the Soviet revolution, just as she believed in the ideals of the US, right? What, what, what we could be um, and refused to be um, broken. Uh, by by the the reality of falling short of that I, those ideals for her the the 
the point is to always move towards those ideals, right? To, to never forget what they are and to, and always to, to, um, to work, to, to, uh, to recognize, to realize them. I mean, I, I can't, I can't really can't say it any better than that. Um, and I mean, as we begin to think about our legacy, something occurred to me when you were speaking there that about people saying she was just a figurehead or mm -hmm. just, you know, a bit of symbolism or being head of the, in the Communist Party at the time. But I mean, a lot of criticism or, or sort of slights have been put towards of it. Oh, she was, you know, the rebel girl as, or she was just um, an activist. So she wasn't very theoretical, her books weren't very theoretical. And I think that's a sort of, it's a really telling criticism, especially now where, I don't know about in the United States, but in Scotland, the gulf between the left and the working class is massive. And it's partly because the left can quote Marx and Lenin, but they wouldn't have dreamy coming into a, you know, a working class area and, and trying to organise people. And it seems to me that it's very telling criticism, whereas actually... I mean, Governor Flynn's life is an incredible activism that and and clearly smart, intelligent woman who goes through a whole lot of struggles as a as an equal to all these really famous uh, men and in Goldman's case, women as well. But what what does it say about our legacy that people make that kind of assumption that because she was such an activist and a narrator that maybe she wasn't such a strong thinker? Yeah, I've heard that many times. And as someone who myself is not very theoretical, um, for me, the value of theory is what, how does it help improve people's lives? And I think that I think, you know, there's a saying that your research, you don't find your research interests, your research finds you. And, and I, I really feel like that that's the case with with the work that that um, I, I've been doing. Um, there's so much in Flynn that that is so um, relevant and relatable to to me and to and and as you said, I think to any activist who who never forgets that what really matters is advancing the interests of working class people. And she never lost sight of that. I, I interviewed um, I interviewed a, a very older gentleman who I'm sure has has passed away because it's uh, interviewed him in 2010, who was a member of the Young Communist League at Cornell University um, in the 40s. And he invited Elizabeth Curley Flynn to speak several times. And I was given his name by another uh, a, a communist, um, actually Robert Thompson's wife, who was one of the first uh, Smith Act defendants, and he, it, Thompson and Flynn were, you know, comrades and friends, and and this woman knew Flynn, and she directed me to this gentleman, and he was telling me about uh, the times he invited her to Cornell and how fantastic it was because she would come early and she would talk to people in the community, she would read everything she could read, she would talk to the students, and he said, you know, here we are, like young strapping college boys, and this woman would come, this middle-aged woman, and she'd drink us under the table, and we'd be exhausted, and she'd still be up, you know, where are you going? The night is young, and then she would stand in front of an audience the next day, and he said they weren't all communists. These are people who had heard her years ago and were dying to hear her again. These are people who had no interest in communism, but they loved Elizabeth Gurley Flynn. And he said she would touch on issues that were relevant to them in their moment, in their place, because she had taken the time to listen, to read, to learn, and to connect. And that that's what she was. She's called, you know, a lot of, of uh, historians of the Communist Party say, oh, she was a mass figure. And I think there's an implied criticism in there. Right, she was a yeah, she was one of those people that the mass is like. But what do they know? But what do they know? I mean, that's what the movement is about, right? And and never ever ever did she stray from that. Uh, she she was an orator first and foremost. She kept a diary, and she would. And I don't know if she kept it throughout her life. The diary that I've seen is a you know a diary when she was a younger woman. She would write quotes from literature, quotes from Marx, but these were all things that she would use to make the struggle meaningful for working class people and to galvanize them. She gives a great speech after the Patterson strike. It's called The Truth About the Patterson Strike, which is a failed strike. And there was a lot of criticism, some of it absolutely justified of the IWW. And for many historians, that's the beginning of the end of the, you know, the real kind of high point of the, of the IWW. But she gives a brilliant um, explanation of what solidarity is. And she says, it's not a word. It's not an abstract concept. Solidarity is marching together. Solidarity is picnicking together, it is singing together, it is recognizing that your interests and my interests overlap. So we need to have activities on Sundays because Sunday is the day when strikes are broken because there's nothing going on and people are looking at their kids hungry, they're listening to you know their, their wives or their in-laws complain and we need to get them out and get them marching together and get them to see that it's one for all and all for one, not in theory, but in practice. 
she's opposed in the in the Patterson strike. She's opposed to the Patterson pageant. You know that that theatrical representation of the strike in in New York. Why are we doing that? She says we need to be on the picket line, keeping scabs from getting in the doors of the factories. Not appealing to liberals in New York with a play. Those workers belong here on the picket line. She's telling them don't picket at the courthouse when we're being arrested for picketing. You go out and keep picketing. Right? It's all about like tactics to to break the power of bosses, to build the power of working people. It is about making concepts relevant to working people, empowering working people, uh, you know, and that to me is what the struggle should be. I mean, what's the point of sitting in a room arguing whether Marx, you know, was, was right or wrong about this? Let's get out there and organize. And that's what she did. Absolutely. And it's incredible to think just how relevant she is as we sit here in 2021. All these um, arguments would still be taking place. Yeah. Tell me then, just in terms of that relevance, how is Flynn remembered now in the United States? I, you know, I'm seeing um, increasing interest in Elizabeth Gurley Flynn. I think so. There's a few reasons why, right? She's sort of faded from view. Um, one is that uh, she's female. And so, you know, we don't we don't do a, such a good job of remembering uh, women who are active in the labor movement. Um, she's not female. She doesn't come into the movement in the way that a lot of women do. So she doesn't come in. Mother Jones is widowed. She doesn't come in that way. Emma Goldman is, you know, is childless and an advocate for free love. Flynn has a child. She's marries and gets divorced. Um, she's not activated because, you know, they kill her members of her family or because her husband dies and now she can do it. She makes a conscious decision as a young girl and she sticks with it throughout her life. And we don't have a lot of room in the narrative for that. When she's the rebel girl, it's really easy. She's this beautiful, dynamic, young, you know, I, I often think of that when I see a Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, right? This beautiful, dynamic, eloquent woman. So where's the category? for the middle-aged kind of chubby woman or the elderly woman, right? Well, I guess Mother Jones, but Flynn never wanted to be mother. In fact, even when she was in Alderson, she said, the one thing I would never let anyone call me was mother because I have one son and he's gone and that's, that's who I am a mother to. So she did not let herself get kind of inscribed into that role. So there's that. Um, she became a communist in a country that refuses to believe that anything good ever came from uh, communist activism in the US. Um, and so uh, we've divorced the civil rights movement from its connections to the Communist Party. Uh, we've divorced you know, radical feminism from its connection to the Communist Party. We've divorced the labor movement. Um, and so um, you know, in a country that was so committed to Cold War politics, uh, she's been written out uh, for that reason as well. Um, but we are, we are increasingly moving away from the kind of uh, strictures that were imposed on us by the Red Scare and the Cold War. We are able to talk about economic inequality in ways we haven't been before. There is a, uh, a resurgence of labor radicalism in the U.S. or of labor activism at least. Um, and I think all of these uh, young people are way more likely to talk about themselves as working class uh, than middle class. Uh, they are not uh, turned away by red baiting. The word socialism doesn't make them tremble. They are not children of the Cold War. So there's a space that has opened up um, to, uh, to remember, to revisit the kind of work that Flynn did. Uh, they are seeing connections between anti-racism and anti-capitalism, anti-imperialism and anti-capitalism, and that Flynn was all about that. And so I think that we are, you know, it's not that we are finding out new things about Elizabeth Hurley Flynn. I think we are returning to a place where we can appreciate um, what Flynn did. Goldman was um, Goldman was terrific. Emma Goldman. Very often, Flynn and Goldman are oh, there's Flynn and there's Goldman, and, and she was terrific. But um, Goldman was an anarchist. She wasn't an organizer. Uh, she was deported. Um, and I think the the legacy that Flynn left in terms of you know tactics for the free speech fights, her contribution to the history of civil liberties. Um, uh, organizing strikes, her her um, work with the Communist Party, anti-fascism, anti-racism, all these other things. That's such a rich legacy. Um, and I think she deserves to be at least as recognized as Emma Goldman, as one of the you know most exciting, energizing, badass radicals ever uh, to be part of the US political scene. 
I haven't read it, but there's a novel out uh, now about, about Elizabeth Gurley Flynn as well, The Cold Millions. I, I've ordered it, but I haven't got and read it yet. But I, I suppose those type of representations in, in fiction can often help as well in terms of bringing people's name recognition and then people might delve further into that. Yes, someone brought that novel to my attention. I actually wrote to the author. I, I have to review it for a, a, a labor journal and we're doing a, we're doing a working class uh, lit um, reading at my university. And so I'm gonna read a passage from that. And I said, holy cannoli, a, a, a work of fiction that has Elizabeth Crowley Flynn as a character in it. And from what I've read so far, I've not gotten very far that it, the author really does justice to Flynn. Um, it's fantastic. I mean, the times they are changing. This would not have happened 10 years ago, probably not even five years ago, certainly not 20 years ago. And of course, we've got your book coming as well. Can you tell us details when, when's the book due for publication? Yeah, uh, it's so it's going to be published with Rutgers University Press and they're terrific to work with. It's been stalled by COVID. The archives shut down and I still have some more archival work to do. So I'm hoping uh, to get it to them by the end of the year, which means it should be out before the end of 2022. Uh, the title right now is uh, The Rebel Girl, Democracy and Revolution, Elizabeth Hurley Flynn's work for civil liberties 1906 to 1964. And um, it's essentially uh, it's a, a biography of sorts. But what the through line is Flynn's uh, commitment to civil liberties. That's what connects her activism from that first time she stood on a soapbox um, in Times Square to her closing statements in her Smith Act trial. It's all about creating space um, for working class people to advocate uh, and to, to, you know, to be active uh, for their own uh, interests and for their own liberation. Um, Sounds fantastic. And I, I often say to people that James Connolly is a person from our past from history, but he's also a person for our future, I think. Sometimes society's got to catch up with people like Connolly and Elizabeth Gurley Flynn. Excellent speaking to you, Mary Ann. Thank you very much for joining us on the pod. Thank you for having me. And what a great duo, Flynn and Connolly. Exactly. Brilliant. Thank you. Cheers. Thank you. Thanks for listening. And thanks to all the guests who have been on the pod in the last season. And thanks to all the team at Cowgate Media who have helped make it happen. We will be back in August with season four, Ball Hill to the Pod. In the meantime, you can listen to our archive wherever you get your podcasts. For more information, follow us on social media or visit 107cowgate.com.